Okay, here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. Today is the day of love. We're here on the day of love. I love doing my podcast. All right, let's get into it, Matthew. Come on. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, ti, ro, mi, ya, yo. Let's get a drink and get a drink, get a drink. Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Procrastinated Podcast. I am your host, Matthew B. Stoin. Stoin. Matthew B. Stoin. Thank you very much for joining me. Today is currently the day of love. Today's Valentine's Day. I hope you spend a good day with your loved ones or loved one, your significant other, even though it's a COVID birth, a COVID Valentine's Day. Hopefully you had to have a good time, be romantic, and share all your lovin's, lovin's, lovin's with whoever you'd like, whether it be a pet, an animal, a human being, or yourself. Yeah, you know, you deserve some love on this fine day. Love yourself a little bit. But, seeing as though today is the day of love, I think it's somewhat fitting for the theme of the episode to be enemies. Typically the opposite of love. Typically based in hate. So, like as I mentioned, that's the theme for today. We're going to cover a few famous enemies from gangsters to sports giants to sports uh, rivalries, I guess. Not very many things to cover this today, but, you know, we're going to get there. We're going to freestyle, as we always do. That's enough for me for the intro. Roll the, roll the freaking, roll the intro. Build me up, buttercup baby just to let me down. And you turn me around and worst of all, you never call baby when you say you will, say you will. And I love you still. I need you. I need you more than anyone, darling. You know that I have. Build me up. <laughs> Buttercup, don't break my heart. Hello, and welcome back to the Procrastinated Podcast. I am your very famous and well esteemed, in other words, description, description words, host, Matthew B. Stein. Thank you very much for joining me. I hope you are all doing well on this fine Sunday evening. It is currently 7.50 on February 14th in the year 2021. How you doing today? Let me know. How you doing? How you feeling? I'm feeling all right. I had a pretty good weekend. Lived up with some friends, you know. uh, You know, hung out and did the things that friends do. But speaking about today, February 14th, as you know, we have the This Day in History uh, segment, I suppose it is. And only I have two things picked out from history. First one, it kind of based in love a little bit. It's 1861. Abraham Lincoln was on his way from somewhere to back to Washington, D.C. when he decided to stop his train and pull over and meet a young lady by the name of Grace Bedell in person. If you, for those of you who don't know who Grace Bedell is, she actually was the, the young girl, brave young girl, I might admit, that decided to send Abraham Lincoln a letter saying, Hey, honest Abe. You know, if you grow a little, a little chin music, you might get some more voters. And he decided to listen to the then like 11 year old girl and grow out a beard. And he got more votes and became president. So in returning the favor, he decided to stop his train, meet the girl in person, thank her in person. And I think this is kind of a gem of American history. The fact that like an 11 year old girl sent a letter to the one of the most famous presidents in the history of the United States to tell him to grow a beard, and we now know him for having a beard. I, like, if you, th- I think a lot of people, if they think about Abraham Lincoln, they, him and having a beard are somewhat synonymous. And that all came from an 11-year-old girl. How about that? Imagine if he hadn't grown the beard. What would have changed in history? <gasps> Who knows? Whoa! The other thing that I have marked down from... If it, or wait, actually, I'm realizing this isn't, this isn't Valentine's Day in history. I apologize. This is February 16th in history, the day you're watching this. In 1923... Uh, paleontologist, uh, explorer, guy, Howard Car- Carter opened an Egyptian tomb to discover a, a sarcophagus. This isn't crazy news. I didn't really know anything about this. It was some, some king with a super long name, Egyptian king. I just wanted to point this out because like, why are we opening these sarcophagi of, of people that lived thousands of years ago? What are, what are we trying to do? Yeah. Research, learn new things. Who cares? 
could we think about the fact that potentially you could be opening the world to like a whole bunch of demons or something, you know? Like I picture in my head when they open the sarcophagus or the tomb or whatever, like a whole bunch of shadows fly out of it or something or, or bats fly out of it or like there's a big gust of wind and a bloom, like a huge light envelops the whole room. It just seems like a bad idea. It seems like it's a, 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 not a way to set yourself, self, set yourself up for success. I feel like only bad vibes can really come out of that. Also, I realize that my camera's blocking my painting. Oh no. Kanye West. Uh, I'm Michelle Obama. He's trying to show Kanye West love. There you go. Okay, so that's enough from the, this day in history. Let's move on now, really, to the main part of the episode. I, I, I mainly just want to talk about Valentine's Day for a little bit, and then we'll get into the enemies. So, today is Valentine's Day. Uh, I don't really know what I have to say about Valentine's Day, to be totally honest with you. There's not much really for me to write about Valentine's Day. I guess think about what's gone on for me in Valentine's Day in history. I remember being in class in middle school. That was always a good... Valentine's Day was always, like, one of the better days in, at school because everybody brought their Valentines. Like, you brought, like, your Jolly Ranch suckers or whatever, and you could write to to rachel from matthew i have a crush on you yes or no like whatever you could do some cheesy stuff like that or just like i liked having like the tissue box on everybody's desk and you walked around and put them in each box i remember i always made if there was a girl in the class i like i didn't do anything crazy but i, I did always make hers like a little bit more special just to like let her know what's up a little bit. It was never wor it never worked because Matthew, believe it or not, seven year old Matthew Stein is not as clever as I might like to think. But it, it's it's you know love is in the air. It was good vibes. You're happy to you're happy to happy to what get I get candy I guess that was really the main thing. That's what it came down to the end of the day. I was a self proclaimed candy addict as a kid. Believe it or not, I'm pretty sure you all believe it. What else happened for me in Valentine's Day? Uh, I was thinking I when I was typing Valentine's Day on the rundown of like what I want to do for this episode, I thought back like, oh, I could talk about this one time on Valentine's Day where I, oh, okay, I just remember now actually, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so my first real relationship was in, er, real, somewhat real, I guess, was relationship was in sixth grade. I was a young, mature 11 year old in sixth grade and I dated this girl, Macy Hoover. Uh, very beautiful lady. I, I thought she was very pretty at the time. Still think she is now. Uh, she was my first kiss. Pat myself on the back for that one. Go, Matthew. You get him, you young killer. But anyways, uh, we dated for like three months because as my first relationship, so I just kind of rode with it. Didn't know what I was doing. And so we dated from like early December, I guess, then to mid-February. <laughs> So I actually ended up breaking up with her on Valentine's Day. Uh, my longest, or I guess then longest relationship at the time, I broke up with my girlfriend on Valentine's Day. And you may ask yourself, why, Matthew? That's the day of love. Shouldn't you guys go on a date and it be cute and all of these things? Yeah, that's what a normal relationship would do. But one, we're dealing with Matthew Stein. And it was my first relationship, so I don't really know what I was doing. Also, it was Valentine's Day, and I didn't have a gift for her or anything. So I was embarrassed, and I felt bad. So I figured... Instead of mentioning I don't have a gift and I feel bad, let's just break up with her. You know, that's a that's fair logic, right? That that makes sense. That's a that's a, a natural jump that anybody would make. So I did that. We broke up. It was sad. I'm still heartbroken about it today even though it was 10 years ago or so. 10 years. I was thinking about that earlier today as well. 10 years ago I was 10 years old. In 10 years I'll be 30 years old. I think that I've lived a long life so far that I've like done so much or so many things have happened in my life because I'm 20 years old, two decades now, but there's so much time left. Oh my goodness. I'm in like the second inning of the game. Oh my God. We got a long ways to go. The, 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 the circle cycle of life is very long. It almost seems arduous at this point. I got to wait so much longer. Oh boy. That's, that's a whole nother conversation just about future and time and how time passes and you don't really think about it and how time is relative. Does time even really exist? Do we know if time exists? Because I'm not sure. I'm not convinced that time exists. <sighs> Enough. Any, and anyways, at any rate, time is weird. Valentine's Day is today. Love is in the air, whether you believe it or not. Um... I didn't have any romantic dates today, unfortunately. I, I managed to wake up at 2.45 p.m. because I may have had a late, a late night last night. But I woke up at 2.45 p.m. late in bed until about like 
3.30, got out of bed, took a shower, went and ate dinner slash breakfast. Then I came back, procrastinated making this podcast, and now I'm here. So that's been my Valentine's Day. I hope yours was more eventful than mine. I hope you spent time with those that you loved, gave them a big old smooch, let them know that you love them, and enjoy each other's company, because that's what the day is about. And like I said in the intro, whether it was a, a dog, a cat, a human, uh, uh, your favorite blanket, your favorite TV show, your favorite spot on the couch... As long as you shared a moment with a something that you love, I think Valentine's Day is a is, is ultimately a win. <laughs> I don't I don't know what I'm saying today, ladies and gentlemen. I really don't know what's happening. But let's get into the episode. Let's get into the meat and potatoes of the episode. So as I mentioned, even though today is the day of love, the theme of the episode is enemies. Just because, you know, two sides of the coin. Makes sense, right? So really, we're only going to focus on two main ones because I couldn't find any like smaller ones that I wanted to comment on that were interesting to me. Oh, also, sorry, uh, scatterbrain. You like my nails? Uh, they got repainted last night. Uh, they got painted black, black and green, as you can tell. I like the, the green. Sorry, I flipped off the camera. I apologize. I need to use my manners. But I, I've been told that the black would be a good look. I got the black done. Um... I couldn't do 10 black fingers because my personality is just too colorful to that. I couldn't, I couldn't manage that. So then we, we decided on the, on the green middle finger. Uh, I, I like it so far. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see if it grows on me or grows or I grow out of it. Anyways. First enemies, Al Capone and Bugs Moran. Two gangster gang leaders in Chicago in the 1920s during the height of Prohibition. Al Capone was essentially known for running Chicago. He controlled most of Chicago, controlled the Chicago police force, essentially was the mayor of Chicago without being the mayor of Chicago. Bugs Moran ran a bootlegging business, much like Al Capone, out of the north of Chicago. And Al Capone, he was not a big fan of this. He did not support Bugs Moran's action because he was taking money away from Al Capone. Uh, He was posing some kind of threat to Al Capone as well. Just any competition is bad competition. So, I'm realizing now as I'm explaining this that the reason I have this on there is actually it's a beautiful marriage between enemies and Valentine's Day because it came out, it, it kind of wasn't solved, but the, the climax of their relationship was known as the Valentine's Day Massacre. The Valentine's Day Massacre occurred a long time ago. <laughs> One second, I'll figure, that out, figure out when it was. But it happened when... Some of Al Capone's hired men, well, actually, no, allegedly hired men, men dressed as cops and other guys dressed up in suits, all looking all fancy and professional, went to whatever place, where 221 is the number I remember. Anyways, uh, Bugs Moran's hideout, that's where they went, dressed as cops and, uh, and other fancy men, and they knocked on the door, they wanted to say hello, see what was going on, see who was in there. And they were let in, obviously, because they look like cops. So, you know, you're going to let them in because they're cops and something bad could happen. Even though I would think that Bugs Moran had paid off the cops, but... Because I know Al Capone did that, but maybe not, I guess. Who knows? Maybe there were different regions of... The, in, in a, there were definitely different regions of Chicago that were paid off by other people that probably they couldn't corrupt. Anyways, uh, it happened in 1929, by the way. So just 91 years ago, I think that's I think that math is correct. <laughs> But as I mentioned, there were cops and other fancy men that were dressed up to be imposing and they got into Bugs Moran's hideout and they ended up lining up seven of the men inside along the wall or telling them to line up and they gunned them down with their Tommy guns. You know how gangsters did it. And six of them died on the spot. One of them actually survived, which I find quite peculiar because... You would think if you have seven guys lined up on a wall and there's like, what, like four or five of you and you have Tommy guns that you should be able to just and then them all be dead, right? Doesn't that like, how do you not kill people when they're face against the wall with their backs towards you? That seems like an absolute win. Uh, I don't know how you would manage to uh, mess that up, but they did. The guy later went to the hospital. He unfortunately passed away in the hospital. And true gangster fashion, this might be my favorite, one of my favorite parts of the whole story. In true gangster fashion, when he was asked by the police on his deathbed, uh, who shot him, he said, no one shot me. No, but I was not shot by anybody. What a freaking gangster. 
He could have tried to give a description and try and sell him out because they were definitely from the rival gang or something. But he stuck to his guns. He kept the he, he kept the gangsters the gangsters uh the gangsters handbook or whatever the heck. He said nothing. Didn't let those dang pigs get any information, even though the pigs may have been the ones that killed him. Controversy, controversy. But ended up seven people died in the, the Valentine's Day massacre at the hands of Al Capone's henchmen. Al Capone was actually living out his his time in beautiful Florida at the time. Or he was in beautiful Florida at the time, and uh, Bugs Moran famously said, "Only a man like Al Capone could commit a killing like this." And Al Capone, mocking Bugs Moran when asked by newspapers about the killing, said, "Only man like Bugs Moran could take out or, yeah, take out killings like that," uh, which I think is pretty funny. Just mocking on him, picking on him. I wonder what it would like to been Al Capone. I mean, other than the raging syphilis, I bet it would have been a great time, because he was the king of Chicago. He had all the money in the world. Like I said, he did have raging syphilis, but it's okay. Uh, <laughs> funny I mentioned his syphilis because at the end of his life. A year before he died, a Baltimore physician gave him some, like, physical and mental tests and decided that he had the mental capacity of a 12-year-old a year before he died. All because of th he had syphilis for years and years that just kept eating away at his body and slowly killing him before he died of a stroke in 1957 or something like that. <laughs> it, is, it is somewhat pathetic that a, a all-powerful ruling man, like Al Capone, known for being at the height of, or known, of, known for really, like, I guess taking advantage of the pro prohibition when everybody was doing it, being the best at taking advantage of prohibition to, to, to go out from a, an illness like syphilis is, is kind of weak sauce. Uh, it's not a hero's ending by any means, but also he wasn't really a hero. So I guess it's kind of fair. I don't know. Enough talk, <laughs> enough talking about Al Capone syphilis. Uh, so it, it appears that Bugs Moran kind of got the laugh last because, 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 because Capone died of syphilis. But Bugs Moran also died of lung cancer, so, nah, you know, swings and rounds about, swings and roundabouts, they both lost in the end of the, at the end of the day, even though they made a shit ton of money at their peak. Good for them, I suppose. So, number two, the second enemies, I guess I, I would like to mention, are Adolf, 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 and Rudolf Dassler. So, I don't know if you know who these names are. They may sound familiar to you, they may not. Rudolf Dassler was born in 1890 or 1898. Adolf, known as Addy, was born in 1900 in um, Herzengerach, Germany, a small town in Germany. After, so they both served in World War II or World War One. I, I apologize. And when they came back, they weren't. They worked in their mother's laundry business. And out of the back of the laundry business, Addy began making shoes because at the time Germany was in an economic ruin. Unemployment was at its highest. Uh, it was just not a good time to be living in, in Germany. They were very poor because uh, foreign nations had passed sanctions on them because of World War I, which was fair, I feel. But because of that, Addy, Addy had to make shoes because they, they couldn't buy shoes. So this essentially became the start of... I guess the Dassler, the brother, Dassler Brothers Shoe Company later turned into Adidas. But you'd think, so they're brothers, they're not enemies, right? They, they grew up together, they know everything about each other, they're best pals. They even started their own shoe company together, which is true, they did. Addy was the, the, the guy behind production and Rudolph was the guy behind the business. The operations make everything went smoothly. You'd suspect that they would be friends and they would, they would stick together, do what brothers do. But no, 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 no. As they worked together, it soon became complicated as their opinions changed or, or, or battled against each other. Actually, there's there's one incident where the allies were bombing their city of Germany, or at least near their city, so they had to go, everybody had to go into the bomb shelters. Apparently, as Addy and his wife entered the bomb shelters, Rudy said, there, the, there go those bastards again or something, or here come those bastards again. Apparently, he was referring to the people bombing their city because, you know, not very nice of them. But Addy decided that this was a shot at him, him and his wife. Uh, and this really was the spark of their breakup, or at least people say. I, I read an article that said if you ask older people in the community in the German town, that they'll say that one of the brothers actually cheated on their wife with the other brother's wife. 
Uh, there wasn't much to back that up, but it's it's said, it's out there. It's one of the theories as to why they broke up. I think the one about them walking in the bomb shelter is kind of funny, kind of childish, kind of upsetting that they, that ended a brother's relationship. But also it kind of makes sense because that is a small petty thing that, that after they were they're knocking heads about their business, kind of makes sense that it would take the air out of their sails a little bit. But this enemy, or them being enemies is, is a big deal because when they broke up, because they had the, 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 the Dassler Brothers Shoe Company together. When they broke up, they split two businesses. Apparently, they split the business right down the middle. Like, split the desks. Not cut the desks in half. But, like, split the numbers of desks. Everything all the way down to the last penny. Because they're brothers and they're petty. Once, once it gets petty, it's kind of a slippery slope. I know that having brothers. Or a brother. So, after they broke up, one of them decided to take their business across the river that split their town. Uh and start their own business and out of the, this split up we got two very well-known brands now as i mentioned adidas we have adidas on this side of the river and then we have puma on this side of the river uh qu quite incredible to me that a pair of brothers came up with the two two of the most famous uh, shoe or sports brand sporting goods companies in the world at one point they were number one and number number one and number two in the world for for I guess in market sports goods sporting goods market share. A funny thing about them splitting up and going to opposite sides of the river, it actually ended up splitting the town that they were in, like in half. Like they became Puma and Adidas became the two leading workplaces in the town, and people would have to almost pick sides depending on where you worked or where you lived. You had to essentially pick a side. It was like it was almost like two different factions. And they, I even read that the people that once they pick sides, they would have beef or would stop talking to other people that were on the other side. It would even, it, not only did it break up the Dassler family, the actual brothers, but also it would break up other t uh, families in the town because they leaned to wherever they could work probably. Really incredible to that the one Dassler family breaking up because they're a small business, they then split up the whole town and had the whole town divided. And there's still somewhat division today. Not that it's like, heated anymore because in 2009 Puma and Adidas actually uh, they performed I guess or set up a, a a soccer friendly so one team was the Adidas team and one team was the Puma team and they just played each other and kind of like got past their beef I guess settled their beef a little bit and I just incredible me that two brothers really had this impact. I wonder. I wish me and my brother had this impact on Wabash. That would be uh, uh, quite incredible. Split, go on opposite side of the Wabash River. Man, maybe we should do that. Maybe we should start a, some budding rivalry between companies. That'd be incredible. I got to think of some new name though, or some product that we're gonna make because I have no idea what it'd be. One thing I would like to add to this, uh, other than really the breakup, is the way that Adidas really rose to power, or at least the, 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 the way they gained popularity, because I didn't know this. So obviously in 1936, there were the Olympic Games, known as the Nazi Games, that were hold, held in Berlin, Germany. I think Berlin, maybe Munich, but I would get, I think Berlin, Berlin. Anyways, Addy and one of his buddies went to the Olympic Village to give shoes to athletes to race in them. So they just had shoes and because they wanted to get their brand out there. You know, smart marketing. One of the people he managed to give his shoes to was the famous American runner, Jesse Owens. And Jesse Owens famously said he would either run barefoot or in Adidas shoes. He ended up running in those Adidas shoes. He won the 100 meter dash along with three other events and became the most famous athlete in the world known as the black man who won gold, the Nazi games. And this did create a little bit of strife for Adidas within the under the Nazi regime, but obviously they ultimately survived and this helped launch Adidas onto the global scale. Jesse Owens really became the global face almost for the Adidas brand and it, it, it helped them grow exponentially. Another thing that helped them grow was when he sponsored or sponsored gave i guess sponsored the adidas soccer team the or the adidas soccer team the germany national team again i'm talking about addy the guy who created adidas he gave the whole team shoes on their unlikely win to a in a 1954 world cup really again that officially established them on established them on the global market when you're talking about the world cup because that is the world, so it makes sense that that would establish them on the world market. And that was another turning point in the growth of the company. 
And then in 1968, I actually didn't know this. This is actually really interesting to me as being a sports media major and learning about all of the things that go in the sports media world and how times have changed and how you market things and all this. In 1968, at the Mexico City Olympics, both Puma and Adidas took a much more bold strategy than previously known, where they would just give shoes to people and encourage them to wear them. They actually, this was a controversial decision at the time, they started paying athletes, I believe it was under the table as well, uh, thousands of dollars to wear their shoes to represent them in the Olympics. And that really changed sports marketing as a whole as we know it now today. Now that is such commonplace that uh, companies will sponsor athletes and pay them oodles and oodles of money to wear their shoes because of the growth that can give their brand. And they were really the first to do it, at least for the Olympics, in 1968 in New Mexico City. And I didn't know that. And I I think that's quite interesting I, I, that a, just a small brother rivalry sparked this almost exponential change in sports marketing and, and these brands for the rest and rest and rest of time. Uh and really just incredible. Do I have much else to share about it? Not really. So, we're only 26 minutes in. I've gone way through fast this, way too fast through this episode. But I, I kind of decided to be a short episode because one of the common complaints I've gotten, or not complaints, but comments I've gotten from people that watch or listen to my podcast is it's too long. Like... My dad has told me whenever I've had, I think, two or three hour and a half long episodes. And every time that's happened, my dad has always mentioned to me, it's too long, man. I got to watch it in multiple sessions. I got to break it up. So considering that, I've been trying to slim them down a little bit. Last week's episode was about 54 minutes, which is a pretty healthy. It's about still about an hour, but right now we're only at like 27 minutes. So it's going to be an extra short one. Not really that upset about it. I'm kind of interesting to see how it plays out. I would like to keep shooting for an hour, but if this drives people to be more inclined to watch the episodes, obviously that's a good thing because that's the goal at the end of the day. So I guess in keeping with that spirit, let's keep things rolling. Let's move on from two famous sports brothers in the sports world to now the famous corner flag. Yay, corner flag. Yay, corner flag. Okay, so... You'd think, since I'm doing enemies, I would have a lot of stuff to talk about in the corner flag. Uh, In reality, I don't. It's kind of like best friends in the fact that you could go on and on and on forever about pairs uh, or enemies within sports. So I think it'd be fun just to talk about a few of the rivalries I know and a few of the rivalries that stand out to me. Because you've got got some some heavy hitters. You've got like Lakers, Celtics, Red Sox, Yankees, Cubs, uh, Cardinals. Maybe that's not as big as one, but it's up there. You got IU Kentucky, you got Michigan, Ohio State, you got Bears, Packers, you got, um, you got Biggie and Tupac, not sports, but you know, it's another one. And I I was thinking about covering that one in this episode as well. Maybe I should have, but you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. Another famous one for branching out of uh, American sports, Messi and Ronaldo. That's maybe one of the most prominent ones to me, even though it's not. To me, the rivalry is not as much, like, personal, like, really Messi versus Ronaldo because they do play a team sport where each team has 11 players on it and you have to get those 11 players working together to win games. Although, with players like Cristiano Ronaldo and Lionel Messi, you can really win games just on their back sometimes. But I think Messi and Ronaldo is one of the most famous, or will be one of the most famous sports rivalries probably for a long, long time because... I think it's hard to argue against the fact that they are the two greatest of all time in that sport. Messi has six Ballon d'Ors, which is given that oh, an award that's given to the best player in each year of soccer. Messi or Ronaldo has five of them. Messi's sixth is the most all time. I believe Ronaldo's five is second all time, maybe tied for second, but I'm pretty sure it's it's a, a sole second place. And I think that stat on its own kind of defines that the fact that they're the greatest of all time, or greatest of all time. And then you can go even into their smaller accolades, like with the number of trophies they won, especially with Ronaldo, how he's won trophies all over the world from England to Port- maybe in Portugal as well, Spain, now in Italy. Their resumes are, just speak for themselves. There's no, You can't discredit them really in any way. There's nothing... It's hard to sell either of them short and discredit either of their legacies because they're kind of undefeated in a way. I mean, obviously not actually, but nobody really pales in comparison to their success but I guess I say that now but I only maybe I only say that because they're they're what's going on now they're they're what's happening right now and 
like, had I been alive back in the 60s when Pele was playing, even though he's playing in Brazil, would I, would my opinion be different? Would I feel differently about this? Would I disagree? Like, oh, would I be like an old head that thinks MJ is better than LeBron? Be like, Pele did this. Pele won three World Cups. Did Messi and Ronaldo do that? No, they did not. It's it's all subjective. Anybody can make an argument for anything. And that's kind of what makes sports great. And that's what creates casual sports fans to be enemies on their own right. Because you can create an opinion that can disagree with somebody. That can spark a little zing-zang, ping-pong back and forth. And then it can spiral into a heated rivalry. Or you can become great friends that way. It's really incredible the, the way sports can marry people. And, and connect people and draw them together. And create uh, bo never-ending bonds that last till the end of time. I guess. What are some other great rivalries? You guys gotten any? You, you want to let me know of any great rivalries you can think of? What are some good ones? The Pacers and the Knicks. That's a good one. That was mainly like a 90s rivalry. It's not really a long-term rivalry. But if you want to learn more about the Pacers and Knicks rivalry, definitely watch Winning Time, Reggie, Villa, Reggie Miller versus the New York Knicks on Netflix. Incredible. I've seen it like nine times. It's very good. Reggie Miller is a superhero. Uh, eight and eight points in nine seconds will never be forgotten. It'll also probably be underrated for a long time because people don't seem to rate it because they won the game, but they end up winning. They end up losing the next series. So is it really worth it? Does it really matter? It's kind of like the Warriors' seventy-three win season without the championship. Mm, mm, you know, like it's it's hard to say it's a successful season without a championship. Yeah, you set the best record of all time by one game, but like. You don't, you don't, you don't got the jewelry to sh to show it, so it's almost a letdown in a way, which is kind of upsetting that they lost that. I mean, it adds to LeBron's legend because he won the most winningest team in the history of, uh, history of the world to deliver a championship back to Cleveland. But it would be nice. Maybe I'm, I'm a slightly a bit of a Warriors fan, but it would be nice if the Warriors would have won that and really capped off their season because I don't like the fact that J Jordan can just shit on everybody saying. Well, I got six greens and six tries, or um, whatever the hell, whatever else he might say, just because like he loves being on his pedestal, and people give him that pedestal because he probably is the greatest basketball player of all time, or at least one of. But uh, I'm ranting too much. So again, we're blazing through this. We're just flying right through it. As you know, after the corner flag, always comes the ever popular feel good article. So without further ado, let's get right into the feel-good article. Come on, let's do it. hi ya hi ya hi ya So this right here is a interesting article to me. Skinniest house in London listed for $1.3 million. A six-foot-wide home built as possibly the skinniest house in London is being listed on for sale online with an asking price of $1.3 million. Real estate agency Winkworth said the blah, 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 blah. Has the same room as a luxury yacht. Uh, I just picked this up because apparently at, at its na narrowest, it's like just about six feet wide, which sounds incredibly claustrophobic to me. But then you realize that the house is actually five stories tall. So it's really just spread out. It's not wide, but it's got the, it's got the height to it. And apparently it's between, what is it between? Uh... It started, okay, apparently it used to be a hat shop. And then a photographer, of course a photographer, turned it into the ultimate designer house. Ooh, la la la. Yeah, pretty interesting. I just like that it's really small. Maybe here, here, here's a little bit of a, here's an image of it. Go away, go away. Here's an image of it, very small. Wish I had a little balcony. Apparently it has a backside, a backside terrace, so you still have some space outside, which is nice. Whatever. <laughs> Next one, I really like this. This is like, from like in terms of feel-good articles, I feel like this next one's like kind of the pinnacle. Late businessman's dog inherits five million. What it's so nice. A Tennessee dog is living the comfortable life after inheriting five million from her late owner, who stipulated in his will, in his will, in his will that his money should go to his pet. Lulu, an eight-year-old border collie, and was named in the will of owner Bill Doris, a national businessman who died late last year at age 84. Martha Burton, 88, a neighbor who car, car, car oh my god, Matthew, l who cared for Lulu while Doris was away, was named the canine's caretaker in Doris's will, which states Burton will be reimbursed for reasonable monthly expenses. I don't really know what to think about, to tell you the truth, he just really loved the god dog, Burton told, blah blah blah. I really want to know... 
I really want to know how much she's getting paid to be his caretaker because I hope it's I hope she's getting a good cut. Of, <coughs> I hope she's getting a good cut of that uh that eight milli or five milli. But that's so cute. It's so freaking cute. Good puppy. What a good puppy. I like the border collie too because my grandma used to ra raise border collies or breed border collies growing up. Occasionally, every now and then, we would, you would get the off border collie, which was kind of funny. But uh, I remember growing up with them. Going growing up with them, I would give them like a million names just because I was a young kid, and I always every time I saw it, I wanted to give it a new name. Uh, I remember for a while, for the longest time, I could rem I remember like almost a jingle that we created about this one dog that I of all the names I gave it. It was like Toe Jam, um, Fart Pillow. Sammy Sosa was a common name I gave it because I was obsessed with Sammy Sosa growing up. Um, yeah, I, I, I really wish I remembered the list because it, it was kind of funny and there were a whole bunch of random names on there, but I don't. But that's kind of... um. Actually, let's watch this video and then we'll end it. Bear sits next to Guy. Oh, God. What the fuck is going on? He's just living life, looking at what's going on. This dude's gotta be shitting his pants. But the bear doesn't even like give a fuck. I think having a pet bear would probably be the coolest bear or coolest animal to have in the animal kingdom, maybe. Because they're just so big and obviously it's terrifying, but they're just so big and cuddly and honestly really stinking cute, especially bear cubs. Oh, they're adorable. But I, th I would like, if I could pick any large animal or any animal in the world to have as my pet and if it was like, if I knew it was going to be safe, I would probably pick a bear just because they're so big and cuddly and I just love him. Look at him. He's just a big, a big chunk. Oh, and then, he, and then he pops a squat. God, they're so massive. Look at his head. Oh, my God. That, oh, his head just looks freaking huge. And that's like a, a 30th of his body. Anything, does anything else happen? Hey, 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 hey. Wow. Oh, what? Oh, okay, well. And then you pan to the end and you realize that it's almost like a spoiler. Look, this dude just watching all kinds of bears play in the river. I didn't know that was happening. Had I known that I was happening, this clip would not have been nearly as interesting. Uh, I mean, it still would have been, but also not really. I didn't, what? Okay, well. That dude's life is dope. He's just a nature photographer. That is another job I would love to have. Uh, but I've, I've rambled on long enough. I, I Part of me wants to just make this an hour, but I said I was going to keep it short. And we're at 38 minutes right now, so I'm just going to end it here. Screw it, you know? I'm a freaking rebel. I don't know. I apologize. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I know it was a little shorter, but I'm trying to mix it up and see how we feel. Uh, let me know what you thought of the shorter episode if you... Have my contact info. Feel free to get in touch with me. Let me know. Text me. Shoot me a DM. Comment on this video. Do whatever you'd like. But not much more needs to be said. Support the podcast. Actually, if you could go rate it, like give it a rating on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts or anything else, that would be very lovely. I would very much appreciate that. But beyond that, like it, comment it, do whatever, share it. Tell your mom, tell your dog. And I'll see you in the next week's episode. I've been your host, Matthew B. Stein. You've been fantastic. I will see you next Tuesday. Peace out.